Looking to get started at 6.30, that's the time of the presentation being started, so I want to get started. I've got slides to get through. My name is Gary Mann. Um, I, uh, I'm not here representing any organization per se, other than a group of people that have signed this petition. We're calling ourselves Sterling Pesticide Awareness. If you need my information in terms of getting in touch with me, I'll, I have some cards here that I can hand out, which has my information out of here, which you can copy down here. I'm, again, I'm not representing any group, though I am on the Board of Health. I'm not representing the Board of Health. If I'm representing any organization, I'm a volunteer for this organization uh, called Raptors Are the Solution. It has to do with another issue concerning pesticides that I'll be discussing later in the presentation. If you have questions, quick questions, I'd be happy to address those. If you have more longer-winded questions, I'd like to kind of save those at the end. We have some handouts to, to hand out to you at the end of the presentation as well. And then we can entertain um, more of the more difficult questions, if you will. Come on in. Come on in. Um, when I was first doing this uh, presentation the other day for the Sterling Democrats, which was on March 25th, as I was going over my presentation, I had a pop-up screen come up, and, and this came up, so you know, instantaneously said, Portland's banning synthetic pesticides in the city of Portland, Maine. So it's relevant. It's going on today. These things are happening right as I was working on this presentation. And Coincidentally, today, when I was going over my slides, this popped up. And uh, this is from the American Bird Conservancy, and there's a, there's a bill before Congress now, federal bill, H.R. 1337, which talks about systemic pesticides and moving towards regulations, more regulations on systemic pesticides. This, this warrant article, the key word is systemic pesticides, and we'll talk more about that. Wait, did that, that excuse me, didn't that last slide say synthetic? This that last slide is synthetic, which right. includes systemic as well. That, that includes all pesticides. It includes, in fact, I even called up, I called up that, the, the hardware store, Portland Hardware, or Maine Hardware, I think it was referenced in that, that uh, particular slide. Let me see if I go back to it. Yeah, somewhere down here, there's a picture. This is from the Maine Hardware uh, store. It's a picture from the, from the actual store of the shelves. And it was a picture of a guy there down below from uh, Maine Hardware. So I actually got on the phone and said, well, how about fertilizers? And he said, yeah, anything said of fertilizers as well. And like I asked him about halts for the, for the prevention of crab gas. Yes. I know we're not selling it anymore. We're depleting our stocks of it. So it's, it's a current issue, and it's you know, happening with us every day. Now, um, I was, as I was going through this presentation, thinking about how do I start it off, and how do I get going on this? And I was, you have these adages like think globally, act locally. I like to think I'm doing that, and that I'm a single person, but I need a group of people to get things done. Um, and of course, that's a challenge in and of itself. And I'm going to be talking, I decided, however, just looking at my background, being here in Sterling, I've been in Sterling now for 35 years, and I never gave all this stuff much thought through my 35 years until really the last 10 years when I got on the Board of Health, actually. But I'd like to say as I start off, if I were to give this presentation in Houston, Texas, they would say, you've got no problem at all up there. I mean, you, compared to what's going on down here, this was a fire in Houston about a month ago. I'm not even sure it's still burning down there right now. But compared to what they've got down there, you know, we're not in Texas. That's not the issue. We don't have any problems anywhere near that. But we do have issues, for sure. How, how bad they are, I guess that's up for us to make our own judgments on. I looked at uh, here in Sterling. These are, these are sites that are hazardous waste sites or power plants or landfills or super sun, super fun sites. And in Sterling, we only have one site that even comes close to qualifying that. And it's the, it's the lowest level of hazard. And that's our cap landfill, okay? That's the only one. So we're in pretty good shape here in Sterling from that perspective. Uh, where is that cap landfill? It's uh, right behind the police station. Okay. Um, as far as uh, the cancer stats in town, um, as far as uh, what, what's predicted versus the actual, we're in great shape, uh, at least for the, from this chart. The only one that's just a, the only cancer that's statistically significant here in Sterling is this kidney and renal cancer. And that's statistically significant, meaning it, the, the observed, uh, the observed uh, cases exceed what was expected. Okay? And that might be re related to this issue that we have, we have, we're living on uh, you know, a granite, I think it's called the Clinton Fault Line, and it's all granite here. We have a lot of, we have a lot of deep well drills drilled down into that granite mine goes down through 300 feet and I have arsenic in my water. Now, the arsenic in my water um, is uh, 10 parts per billion and it just, it, 
been holding pretty steady at that. And that was fine for years and years until 2001, the EPA changed it from 50 parts per billion as a safe limit. They reduced it to 10. They divided it by 5. So all of a sudden now, if, I, you know, if, I, if it goes any higher, like to 11, whereas before it would have been a problem, could have gone up to 50, now it will be a problem for me in terms of meeting that limit, for example, if I go to sell the house. Okay. So again, pretty good shape here in store. However, you know, however, there are issues here. This goes back to a property uh, on Taft Road, which has been contaminated by this pesticide going back years, where that property is, is uh, had issues with being trying to be marketed. They have difficulty selling it because the land is contaminated with this pesticide, with some 50 acres. I'm not sure how many other properties in town are contaminated like this, but this was significantly tested because they were looking to sell it to the town. The town wanted to put ball fields up there, and they had it tested, and it came back positive. So that's a real, that's a real issue. Is that tested over the whole property or in certain Multiple areas? tests, multiple tests. Uh, multiple? Yes, I, I think they did. always had spills up there when he was a dealer, or they could hit one of those spills but really throw that off. Could possibly. I know that they tested in multiple locations. They, they dug down to three and four feet. They tested the water that came to this, you know, the, the groundwater which came to the surface at that point, high groundwater table. And so yeah, that's a real issue. They, at least they, they, uh, they did lose the, uh, uh, the, the opportunity to sell at that particular point. Um, yes? What is deal room? What is that? It's, a, it's an insecticide, which was, okay. the question is what is, I go is back to that slide. Is that saying it right? Yeah, yeah. Dieldrin. Dieldrin? I'm not sure if I'm even pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> yeah. um, right. There's a lot of Dieldrin. And it was used in years gone by. It's, it's, since it's now been banned in most countries. I think there's a few countries out there that still use it. It's banned, been banned in the United States. It was originally interesting, this, this particular pesticide was not, ironically, uh, they say it's not was not toxic to in, insects until they metabolized it in their body and then became poisonous. And then it was the dead insects which actually contaminated the ground. Okay, which was I thought, quite interesting. Um, next slide. Um, another, another problem. Uh, we've got two main aquifers in town. We have the, uh, we have the Stillwater River Aquifer, which is over here in West Sterling, and also uh, right here across the street down the road past Pandock Perkins. And that's where we get our water from. All our four wells are in that Stillwater River Aquifer. And that, of course, feeds the Wachusett Reservoir as well. However, we have another aquifer up over here, the Wikipiki aquifer, and they had done testing on wells off of uh, Flanagan Hill Road, and te multiple tests have come back with trace pesticides and wood preservatives. And so the, the, uh, the water department has made it the conclusion that it probably wouldn't be a good idea to try to pursue development of a new well in that area, and we do need to develop new well fields because we've been pumping every summer, summer at our limit, at our permit limit. And so we're, we're using water as fast as we can take it out of the ground in the summertime. So that's a serious issue. You know, one of your water, one of your, uh, your aquifers, your, your, your fresh water supply aquifers is contaminated. So it's a real problem. Um, so as I said, it's current, it's real and significant, but it is actionable by us. We can try to start doing something about it. And so, uh, this is the reason, of course, why we're here tonight, I'm presuming. You're coming to, to hear about this article, which uh, I, I prepared. And it's based on articles which have been passed in other towns in Massachusetts. It's, a, it's rather benign. Nothing's being banned. Nothing's being prohibited. It's not an article which we're, can be enforced by law or by penalty. So some people, what the heck good is it then? Well, we believe it's a step in the right direction. We're trying to raise awareness. Okay? And I think I can show more about that as we move along. Um, there have been resolutions in these other towns, um, but more of them in these other towns like in Great Bear, these are mostly out in western Massachusetts, but some are in eastern Massachusetts here, as you can see by those red squares. Most of those are on public property restrictions. These other ones are, are basically town-wide restrictions. And they also are resolutions. Again, they're not, they're not in the bylaws at this point, at this point yet. And uh, they're more stringent in the resolution that I'm proposing here. We, we Sterling Pesticide Awareness has proposed here in Sterling, they're more, they're more uh, restrictive and they're looking for everybody to go or totally organic, okay? My concentration, our concentration is systemic pesticides and we'll talk about that as we go further on. Um, one town has actually banned uh, this, this chemical uh, glyphosate 
in Warwick, Massachusetts. They have banned it. This ban has been in place for two years now, and everybody says, well, it'll be challenged in the courts. It'll be overturned. So far, for two years, it has not been. So why are, why are you guys here? I'm presuming you're here because you uh, are concerned about guys like this that, that uh, has come down with cancer, which they, they feel was linked to the, the herbicide Roundup glyphosate. Maybe folks want to go all, go all organic. I know my wife buys everything organic now, which is costing me seriously. It's, everything's organic now in my house. Um, I'm not sure I go along with all that, okay, but that's what she does. She buys the groceries, and that's what I do. I eat the groceries. Um, <clears throat> you, other, you other folks here might be concerned about more <coughs> details of this thing. You know, what's, what's it going to mean for, for me in this town? Um, just pick this off. This was, a, this was CNN. Um, and it was in February of 2019, and they they say it indeed increases cancer risk by 41 percent. I have a question. It's never been proven. Um, I got a, I got a it hasn't question. been yes. proven. That's correct. Yes. The question, question I have is that if we're going to go down that road, we can name just about every food stuff, sugar, coffee, you name it, as being possibly leading to cancer. Okay, and I really question this stuff. The law, you're not a lawyer, are you? I'm not. Okay. But the lawyers are having a field day. Well, witness the handout to $289 million. I don't know how that got through the system. Well, it may not. It's still it's still under appeal, I'm sure. I, I mean, it's still I probably, so. probably be. I would think so. I'd probably think be appealed right to the Supreme Court. I'll tell you, it's yeah. a stretch. When they put stuff like this on, and the law firms are doing it. Right. I, I'll explain that, I think, a little further here. Well, I, I understand where you're coming from. a lot of explanation. Yeah, I'm true. Well, so I, I, and I kind of resent it being thrown all around, like this is going to cause cancer. I and these other gentlemen, and many of us here, have worked in it for 40 years or 50 or more. And we, we sound, we may not be sound of mind <laughs> in this world, but we're sound well, of mind. I think I'll try, try to explain that. I guess my, my approach is that we, we, we use chemicals every day, right? Everybody uses sure chemicals do. for one thing or another. And I, you know, I, I'm taking blood pressure medicine, okay? And I like not to do that, so I try to avoid doing that if I can, okay? So we use them, and I like to say we use them, presumably, if there's another alternative, to seek out the other alternatives. It's really all we're saying here. If there's no other alternative, and that's, that, you know, the risk balance, the risk benefit analysis that you do weighs in that direction, by all means, I guess, okay? That's, that's what I'm, that's my approach, if you will. Okay, that's my purpose. And, it, and again, this bylaw doesn't preclude anything. Okay, it's just trying to say, if, and I'll show you examples of things I mean in well, terms just of what you might be able to do. This stuff here that's loaded on Facebook and God knows where else, like it's the gospel. Oh, that happens everywhere. It happens with everything, right? I, I, I agree. Yeah, it happened in the apple industry with LR. Right. right. And then things changed when they did more study and research on it. So, I, you know, I understand where you're coming from. I, 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 I want to see peer-reviewed stuff, not World Health Organization, Science. because they can they can make a. Science. Actually, the there are there are scientific papers on that. On both sides. Yeah, you both sides, yeah, but on both sides. Well, again, I looked them up. It's again, it's they the, looked up all the different news media, and the news media take take a study with two different things, and they promote what mm. they want to promote, and basically it comes down to. Yeah, you can get by science, not ideology. Yeah. Well, let's review. We can discuss this that very yeah. point. I think okay. the entire rest of the, the evening. So I really yeah. not, don't want to belabor that. We, we okay. come back to that, and really that's a theme throughout here. I think that's going to come up again and again. I hope I have a fact, satisfactory explanation for it. You know, there's there's all these. They'll say it's an agent cancer. They'll say it's an association with cancer. They say it's a cause of disease. It's linked. It's a factor. It's a correlation. You know, it's 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 to go from a link. To a cause, it's a it's a big stretch, okay, okay, and so yeah, you're right, you're absolutely right. They haven't determined it to be a cause of cancer at, at this point, to my knowledge, okay. And I guess uh, news does news today. It seems to be more sometimes of an agenda rather than actual news, right? To a certain perspective. Um, so how did I get here? Why, what brings me here today? I'm not an environmentalist <coughs> per se, as a, by 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 training. I did work in GE for a while as an environmental compliance manager. But uh, my interest started a long time ago when I came across with my brother when I was about 10 years old, came across a great horned owl that had been hit in the street in Pittsfield, Massachusetts at the end of my street on Route 7 and 20. And, I, and I, this, this bird was there and I, I'd never seen anything like it. it had big giant talons on it and uh, 
I was just fascinated by it, and, and it caused me to, be, to read my first book cover to cover, which was this book called Buffalo the Great Horned Owl. And I became fascinated with nature ever since that time. But that kind of took a back seat to, to my life, if you will, and I uh, wasn't front and center. I came here in Sterling 35 years ago, wanted to have a nice lawn, and so we were having the Japanese beetle invasion, and so I used Grub-X. I noticed when I applied this Grub-X to the, to the ground that the, the earthworms would just fly out of the ground, literally writhing and would appear to be pain to me, okay? And I said, I always learned from my father, who was an avid fisherman, that earthworms were good for your soil. He did earthworms, that's good for the soil. So what the hell am I doing killing these things with this grub ex? So I did some research. And I came up with, I came up with this, this, this uh, pesticide, which a biologically safe pesticide called milky spore. And uh, I use that, I haven't had a grub problem since. This is what the kind of thing that I'm coming from. If you can find an alternative, a safe alternative, as individuals, it's not directed, this is directed to the whole town, everybody, all of us as users of these chemicals. If we can find a, a safer solution, why not try it? At least give it a try. That's my, my approach. <clears throat> now, as, as, I, as I got on the Board of Health about 10 years ago, uh, my first assignment, I went to an all boards meeting and, and they, they suggested I, I, I meet with the lake people because they were having issues with the lake, contamination of the lake, lake water quality, they had started using copper sulfate to treat the algae blooms, and they're using uh, <coughs> uh, this, this uh, diquat uh, herbicide to, uh, to basically kill off native vegeta vegetation, not even invasive, just native weeds, which, which uh, the, the input I got from our, our uh, state limnologist, he said, you know, copper sulfate is very toxic. It, 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 it kills the algae quickly but it's very short-lived, and, and that copper sulfate gets, gets locked up in the sediments later on. And the more you apply, every year after year, it builds up. And the same with this, uh, these herbicides. You know, when you kill these weeds in the lake, they die. They, they, go to the, they go into the water column, and they tend to fertilize the lake. And you've got this vicious cycle of fertilization of the lake, if you will, creating more of an environment for um, more algae blooms. Now, they do this pretty much every summer now. And uh, I, I wasn't aware of that until I, uh, I uh, had gotten on the board of health, wasn't aware of the issue. And this is, this is what they're using now, this, this, this uh, weed killer called reward. And it's going directly into the lake. Kills the weeds, naturally occurring weeds that, that are there for fish cover, I mean, for the native fish to survive. Uh, people don't want them on the lake because it follows up their props, I guess. And maybe if it gets too cumbersome, everybody would find it a problem. But, Year after year, and every year, you'll see it on a warning again this year, we're spending t tens of thousands of dollars for treating the lake. Are there other solutions? People, people say there may be other solutions. Other people are treating the lake without these sort of things. All I'm saying is, why, why can't we look at these sort of things? Yeah, can, um, I, can I come to say something about the lake? Um, um, you know, I learned to swim in that lake when I was a child, and you could see the bottom. 25 feet out, you could see bottom. There were a lot of native fish in that Pond and there wasn't very much algae. That's there were turtles that would swim in the lake. Um, there were a lot of muskrats. There were a lot of mussels that you could you know pick and eat. Actually, schema of course. The lake has changed so much since I was a child. Almost all the native fish are gone. The only fish that's really doing well in that lake is largemouth bass, which is an invasive. Um, it never was there when I was a child. The algae that they spray every year is native, and you're not supposed to, to spray and get rid of it. Algae serves a real function. It's habitat for a lot of the animal life and you know insect life and fish life that lives in a lake. It cleans the lake of the carbon dioxide, and it puts oxygen back into the lake, which is what the lake needs in order to survive. So algae is actually good for the lake. What happens when you spray like this is the algae tries to come back and it comes back in greater masses, greater than what the lake can support. So they spray every year. In the meantime, <coughs> the frogs are gone, you know, the water snakes are gone, the turtles are gone, the fish have been <coughs> impacted. There is glyphosates in that lake now. There are dead zones in that lake now. I don't swim in it. Um, three years ago, my grandson was taking lessons during the summer swim session, and they sprayed the lake with that diquat and reward and whatnot. 
several of the children came down with a rash and upset stomachs. So they closed the lake down for two days. Several parents, including me, wanted it closed for another day, and they decided to open it. And the director of the swim program said, oh, the kids ate too many popsicles. That's why they have an upset stomach. And it's quoted in the newspaper. No. Our lake is in serious, serious trouble. It might look good, but underneath there's a lot of dead zones. The fish, animal, um, insect life, everything is disappearing from the lake. And all you have is a lake that's eutrophying. It's not just because you're throwing in the pesticides to kill the algae. No. You throw in other things like nitrates that are used for fertilizers. This is absolutely. And they true. Get, you end up algae is good for the lakes up to a point. Right. You, you then you start amount. to right. choke the lake. So right. you can't blame it completely on that. No, but but um, you're absolutely right. You know, septic systems are leaching into the lake and that's not good. You know, all of that stuff that gets Plus on Plus all the motorized boats they use. Absolutely. There's the, oil and gas dripping into the... That's right. They're all contributing factors. And I was only focusing on the herbicides and, you know, pesticides of, of spraying the lake. But you're absolutely right. All the others are very important factors as well. But, but I bring that up because I think this is a group of farmers and you're arguing that you don't want to stop using pesticides. This is the environment. I think we'd all about. love to stop using it if we. There are good alternatives, but you need to be right. open, right. and you're right. not being open. Okay, wait a minute. Yes. Let's let's, let's, let's not get into a let's not get one into one too big of a discussion here. One last thing I want to say: there are organic um, alternatives to get to control the algae. You know, control all of the stuff that's going on in the lake. There are organic alternatives. This is one of the one of the uh, sites, the Toxic Action Center, which does have have guidelines for how to how to do lake water quality without using these herbicides and pesticides. Um, you know, we're not used in Texas, but you know we do have chemicals coming at us from all directions. And back a few years ago, this was 2013, people were very concerned about West Nile type and Tripoli, Eastern Equine Encephalitis, and they were proposing to spend some sixty thousand dollars to join the state program to have periodic spraying in the area for this for the mosquitoes, um, and uh, that the case was made, uh, in my opinion, fortunately, that the risk was rather small, very, very small, especially compared to the tick epidemic, which they're hardly spending any money on, and uh, so that the article was defeated at town meeting, uh, in my opinion, which was a good thing. And we haven't had spraying since that time. Um, now, uh, moving up to 2017, I started noting, noticing that, uh, and I'd never noticed this before my 35 years in town, that uh, I've been seeing rather large stretches of roadside being sprayed with herbicides. I can tell it because um, it doesn't show quite so well here, but this actually, the picture, this is along uh, Crowley Road, right alongside the Stillwater River, down by the Stillwater River Bridge. And uh, I inquired of the DPW about it, and they, they were adamant that they only spray when, when people, their customers, our, our citizens, call in and say they got poison ivy near the road and they're walking their dogs and they get the poison ivy so they send somebody out there to spray it. Well I, I've seen what appears to be a lot more spraying than that um, but they're, they're convinced in their mind that in fact they only spray for the poison ivy that they would had previously mowed the, these roadsides but they're mower broken, it's too expensive to replace it so it's easy to spray. Um, this is an area right along Crowley Road, right along the bridge, this was all sprayed. Now, who's concerned about poison ivy there across the bridge? Um, this is, right below this is the Stillwater River. They're spraying this glyphosate roundup right there on the bridge. And I talked to the, the uh, DCR, and their answer was, okay, as long as they're not spraying on the banks of the river, it's okay. Well, this is, this is a wet day. That glyphosate's gonna go right into the river. And you know, next to that, they have these signs here, don't walk your dog, because might, might urinate in the woods there, 100 yards into the woods, <laughs> and that's gonna be a problem. But it's okay to spray. This, this dichotomy you know, of, of approach is just what bothers me really on this thing. Now, these are not pictures from Sterling, but I have seen this in Sterling. You know, the operator drives a truck along and they just, and there's a poison ivy, they just spray it along there. And I've seen it on these roads all the way up on 62, almost right from 140, not quite to, it certainly wasn't to Route 12, but it was almost to the, the, um, the overpass, 190 overpass. And I, I can't believe there's that much poison ivy there. And, uh, 
in Maple Street, Rug Road, South Madison Road, Raleigh Hill Road. I have people have, have actually put signs out like I got my I've got a well in my front yard here. Please don't spray my property. And I've had people say to me, you know, that, that have had their yard sprayed. I didn't ask you to spray my yard. I don't have any poison ivy there. And they'll say, well, someone called up and said you have poisoning out, poison ivy out there. So I just asked the DPW folks to be more careful with this. Um, in some of these areas uh, down south, they actually find that it's actually damaging to animal life as well. Animal life like pheasants that are nesting near on the roadsides and it's killing them as well. Even though they say, okay, from their perspective, this is a totally safe chemical. It doesn't hurt anybody. It's, uh, it, I guess they know what it says. It does not bioaccumulate. Animal studies says that it's basically non-toxic to any, anything. Well, I'm not sure I believe that either. Okay, so somewhere I'm in between. Some of us are old enough to remember the bluebirds, you know. Yeah. Um, so what are these effects of herbicides? Only well, we reduce plant diversity of wildflowers, wildflowers that are, are necessary for these pollinators to do their work, and thus you have less pollinators. Um, now I brought this to the attention of my board of health, and I wanted to present an article that the board of health would support. This was about a year ago. And um, they basically felt that it wasn't within the protocol of board health to, to get involved with that. And more of, should be more of a citizen's petition type thing. So I kind of debated on that in my, my own mind and basically decided this year to go ahead and do that. Now, I did write a letter to the DPW, to Bill, and I talked to Bill Tull about this. And, and I said, you know, I'll even, you're supposed to have, the state law says you're supposed to have a vegetation management plan if you're going to do roadside herbicide spraying. You're supposed to prepare one, hold and prepare one. And I said, well, you know, I'll help you. We'll prepare. We had a volunteer from the audience uh, last last presentation. She we actually went met with the DPW and said, we'll prepare this thing for you, okay? And as long as you, we can work with you and put it together and try to minimize the goal of these vegetation management plans is specifically that to minimize the use of herbicides and pesticides in your vegetation <coughs> roadside vegetation plan. And uh, uh, so far, I haven't had too much of a you know buy-in from them. Um, and of course, you'll see these signs all over the place now. Everybody's spraying their yard for ticks and, and mosquitoes all over the place now. And these, these are not, these products are not systemic. That means they spray on and they can wa be washed off. They, they don't get into the viscera of the, of the insect or the plant, um, these type of erythrins, if you will. And some of the other ones are really benign, natural garlic sprays and that thing, but they don't kill the insects, they, they just repel them. But these things are, I mean, my three neighbors are spraying this stuff. And the guy comes out with his Ghostbuster suits on, and they're spraying the yards all around my house. And I don't know, I said, is that really necessary? Is it really necessary? We never did it before. You know, we have mosquitoes. You know, you could use common sense measures, like making sure you have no pockets of water around your house, or a swing set, or a tire, or something filled with water. You do these sort of things. You try to minimize your time outside at night, and then sort of minimize your exposure to them. Um, some people notice this as a woman, Robin Yurkovitz, doctor up on Elliott Road, wrote this letter. And I said, oh, someone else is seeing this, not just me. Someone else wrote a letter about this thing. So they're concerned about it. Um, but then, fast forward to 2018 from the previous year, and I was, I was elected by my, my, uh, my daughter, son-in-law, to become, because uh, I was retired. And I think they brought me out of retirement to take care of their children during the day because they're working and teaching and that sort of thing. So I'm taking care of my two little grandkids and my two little grand dogs and even my grand cat over there. And uh, I was over at their house one day and I noticed they had a box of this decon there. I said, geez, uh, my first concern was what if your dogs get, get into that? You know, get into that. It's going to poison a darn dog. And I said, well, what about the kids? And then, you know, my, my children, my daughter, my, my grandson are very much into this organic stuff. And I said, how can you do this and then do this? That doesn't make any sense. So I convinced them to stop using rodenticides. Before I knew anything more about it, I was concerned about the two, black, the two, the two labs we have, and also the kids. So I started doing some research. And it, it, this particular type of rodenticide is basically like warfarin. If you have, maybe some people here are on warfarin. It's a heart medication. It thins the blood. It helps to prevent strokes. Well, it's used in, in high levels for these rodents the point that it causes them to bleed internally, and they, they, they make their way outside to look for water because it kind of dehydrates them. They become in a weakened state, and they're easy prey for the predator, and the owl or the hawk grabs them, and then the owl or the hawk is poisoned as well. Um, I started doing some research again, as I said, 
and, and children indeed are affected by this. There's thousands of calls every year going into the poison control centers. People that have, children that have ingested rodenticides in the house. So it's a, it is a significant problem. And of course, pets too. It's the most common call to pets. They, they, my dog ate the rat poison. What do I do? And that sort of thing. So it's a big, it's a big deal. But, but, however, this is what really kind of scared me with the most, because again, going back to Bubo the Great Horned Owl, my favorite bird, back that I, that I found on Route 7 back when I was 10 years old, you know, it's killing these, these I, I find these fantastic raptors, these beautiful birds of prey that I think are so in, intense. They're, they're, uh, I've I just been fascinated by them, and I was just uh, horrified by the statistics, there's endless statistics on how many birds of prey these, these poisons are killing every year. And uh, but however, the, the, most, uh, the most compelling article was this article, which was written by Ted Williams, not the baseball guy, but, a, but an environmental author. And he was a, here at the, the Tufts Animal Clinic right down here in Grafton. And he was observing Dr. Professor Maureen Murray as she was doing necropsies or autopsies on these birds of prey that had been presented to her. And she was determining their cause of death, doing liver biopsies. And, uh, and as he said, you can see the anguish in her eyes as she's going through the slides of these birds. You know, the red-tailed hawk that had a hematoma to his left eye, uh, great horned owl. And in, and in fact, the great horned owl, like Bubo there that I read about, um, she does not see a single great horned owl that is submitted to her facility these days that she tests now. They may, not, they may have been killed by a car. But she'll be tested them anyway. She take, gets a little one, she sends a test out. Every single one that has, she has tested, whether or not killed by a rodenticide, has tested positive for rodenticides in their liver. liver. So that's how widespread it is. Um, Red-tailed hawks, commonly affected. Even, even, of course, the vultures, which are feeding on carrion on the roadsides. And, and uh, this was the saddest of all. This was, a, was basically a female red tail with, with, her, with, her, with her egg sacs that were uh, that was killed. Everyone is a, of course, it's a cruel death to these animals, and um, it's a slow, a slow, painful death, and it's, uh, I think, just unconscionable in my opinion. There are many, many things that you can do instead of using rodenticides. Um, you can use, I have a house cat in my house that eats the, the mice every, you know, I, I try to keep the mice out as best I can by sealing the entrances, but a few, a few make it in, and <coughs> thereby the cat is able to mostly dispatch most of them. And I use snap traps, and there's an electro electronic trap which electrocutes them. And, you, and there's carbon dioxide pellets here that you can put into their burrows and it suffocates them, all without using rodenticides. This, however, is, is the most unique trap available. It's just come out, invented by uh, some guy down in New Zealand. And basically, it's self-setting, self-baiting, self-clearing. It kills up to 24 um, rodents before you need a new charge of the CO2 canister here at the bottom. Only about this big. And it's not, this is much bigger than it. It's very small. And the, and the rodent goes into this area investigating the bait, and it gets hit by a plunge, trips a plunger, and a plunger hits him in the head, and it kills him instantly. And um, I think that's an excellent type of a, of a control for that because it solves all the problems of these uh, rat traps. Now, anticoagulant rodenticides are indeed systemic, and um, you have an apex predator up here like the great horned owl. And someone puts out a bait box out here, and uh, these bait boxes look kind of like this. This is not a bait box, but they, you'll see them on the ground. I was over here at Sterling Village. My father-in-law was admitted there for a while the other day, and I noticed these are all around the outside of the building here. Okay? Big open field, great habitat for hawks and owls to, to do, their, do their job, but what do we have? We have these bait boxes around. And this, this poison gets into all these organisms, uh, verte vertebrate organisms, invertebrates, the likes, plants as well. That's what we mean by systemic. It gets into everything. The raptors, of course, they don't populate quite like rodents do. Rodents procreate profusely, right? A, a, a pair of uh, mice or rats will, will produce a progeny of several thousand at the end of a year, whereas an owl produces maybe two uh, for a year. And one of those won't survive the first year of life. They, they have enough stresses on them as they, as they already do without the poison. Um, and now, again, I was trying to compare West Nile and Tripoli with uh, with Lyme disease, Lyme disease is far, far more prevalent. I'm, I mean, I've been affected by Lyme disease. Maybe some of you have been affected. I don't know. Everybody in my family, one, one, each family I have associated, everyone's been affected by Lyme disease in one form or another. And what is the, what is the vector, the main vector for Lyme disease is this fellow right here, the white-footed deer mouse. Okay? That's what's carrying 
the first blood meal for these ticks. And the, the, the main predator of these white-footed deer mice are the owls. They hunt them at night. And so if we eliminate this apex predator, we're going to get more of these, and more people are going to get Lyme disease. So again, going back to not using poisons, let the raptors do their thing. <clears throat> again, what's the most salient purpose of this, this war in art? It's trying to, to encourage you to seek out alternative methods other than pesticides, herbicides, and rodenticides. Uh, <clears throat> the most pesticides are concerned are insecticides, herbicides, or rodenticides. Again, securing a better environment for all of us, wild and, and human, if you will, by protecting these pollinators and other animal species as well. So, there's a new class of uh, these uh, pesticides called these neonics. Neoniconoids, um, and they they act like nicotine in terms of the, the sensory perceptions of some of the insects, like the honeybees. And apparently, in testing that they've done, again, you can argue it was a peer reviewed. From the peer reviewed studies I've looked at, it indeed is considered to be one of the main factors, not the main factor, of the hive collapses. That they believe that because these these bees are affected by these systemic pesticides, their immune system is not able to tolerate these these um, pesticides parasites that they have, which are wiping out many of the hives. And systemic, and you, know, you think about systemics, it gets into the entire plant. You can, you, can, you can put a soak a seed, for example, in a systemic pesticide, and that systemic pesticide gets into the DNA of that seed, and it goes right up through the, all the structures of that, that plant, including the fruit. And when they were first using this to grow beans, they were finding the beans were you know, as poisonous as, the, as a systemic pesticide itself. So again, one reason I like to think of organic is that maybe I'm not going to be eating a systemic pesticide. Now naturally, you know, we have chemicals in just about everything these days, but again, trying to avoid it wherever possible. Um, these are some of the trade names for these, some of these pesticides. If you see some of these, if you can try to find an alternative, that would be recommended. Um, if you want more details on this one, you can get my card, you can call me, my intent. If you send me a question via email, call me up. My intent is to answer every one of your questions. And if I don't answer your question, it means I didn't get it. So by all means, remind me. My intent is to answer every question that, that, that uh, comes to me. And you, you, tend to get, you tend to get statements like this. Um, I checked that statement out, and it says the number one cause of colony, colony collapse is neoniconics. Uh, neonics, as they will. Um, I have not found that to be true. It's, it's a cause. It's a factor. But it's not the cause. Okay? There's, there's not multiple factors. Um, these are the factors that they can, how they can affect some of these pollinators, like the honeybee, um, and that has been peer reviewed and it's effectively been proven. If you see a label like this on a plant, maybe you can try to buy another plant. I, get that. I mean, uh, vet, vendors like Home Depot and Lowe's they respond to, you know, consumer sentiment. If you're not buying the stuff, they won't put it out there. If you're buying if you're buying, if you ask the, the, uh, the assistant there, I want something without these pesticides, these systemic pesticides, they get enough of these kinds of complaints, they will try to get, try to appease you and try to get what you want. Yes, are, you have a question? Are they required to, to put it on, whether those pesticides are on your plants? Um, Oh, no, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I, I don't think they're required. Because I saw that once and I said that's interesting because, you know, you, you go to, to buy something and you've got intentionally, but if they don't need to put it on, then That's correct. I don't, I don't believe that they are actually required to put it on. And again, that's a question about, you know, someone can make a law for something. Well, that's, a, that's against the law to do that. Okay, well, you know, right now we're, we don't have a vegetation management plan, and it's required by the CMR that we should have one. We don't have one. We've never had one. Okay, but so it's against the law. But does anybody do anything about it? Not yet. Yes? Thank you, Gary. Um, yeah, I think Lowe's a couple of years ago uh, stopped Putting plants, selling plants with that. Probably because I would of public outrage. Yeah, yeah, because of public outrage. Right. I'm not sure about Home Depot. I think they may have followed suit, but you have to check with the stores because they do have to tell you. They're banning it by, by next year, they'll have it no longer. Lowe's, Norm, okay. uh, Home Depot by next year, right next whatever year. stock is out they, there. They've said there's something they similar relative to. However, I've looked at that, and over a dozen of the tests, when they do the test on this, when they're feeding, they're taking the sugar and mixing it with the neonics, and the rate they're using 
is like 10 times more than anyone would ever use. And yet the bee, bee population in Europe, England, Canada, the United States has been increasing. People say they're all dying off. They're not. Well, please send me your references. I, I appreciate that. If I can, if I can care to share that with me, I'd be happy yeah, to look at the University of Columbia. Also, one of the things that they're using, <coughs> they're using neo neonicotinoids as a general term. There's many different classifications of them. Mm -hmm. And so you really can't generally say neonicotinoids. Now, believe me, I'm, I, I need pollinators more than anybody in this room. But what you're doing is you're grouping farmers with people that are using some of these chemicals. I think I'm going to address your question okay. here, okay? Because you said as we get to the end of the presentation. Anyways, okay. there are neonicotinoids right. that are bee friendly and they're classified as such. Okay. So it's very, you know, very, you know, wrong okay. to say group all, together. All the same. Yeah. Um, well, that notwithstanding what your data shows, this is the data that I've gotten, and I, I believe that this is uh, peer reviewed that they are, in fact, they are disappearing. I'm not sure why we'd be doing this if it weren't, but um, hey, I'm, I'm, I'd like to believe I keep an open mind. And if I see data contrary to that, I certainly will acquiesce. Um, I get more and more data. I find it all over the place that, that these pollinators are, in fact, dying off. I, monarch butterflies, which I think you, you, you have these anecdotal stories of your own experience of you know, seeing monarch butterflies and then not seeing them anymore, you know, that sort of thing. Or seeing a, a hummingbird moth that was used to frequent the yard and not seeing them anymore. Uh, that's anecdotal. I recognize that. That's not a peer-reviewed study. It's just my observation. We're not seeing honey beers like I used to see them. That's anecdotal. It's not. It's not peer-reviewed. But it, it does influence you. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't influence me. Um, what's what's again disputing what you're you were saying here? This is what I'm finding. And in fact, these things, habitat loss, pollution, pesticides, and disease, are in fact are wiping out our pollinators. Um, they're actually finding these ne neonics in hummingbirds, where well, they had never found them before, in hummingbird tissues. Now, they haven't killed any hummingbirds, to my knowledge yet. They haven't got data on that yet. They have just done testing on dead birds and have found the neonics in their tissues. Okay. Not a favorable thing. Of course, honeybee is an, is, uh, is an invasive species, right? It was an introduced species. It was never here originally. Most of our pollinators were native, some 4,000 species. And the honeybee was, uh, is, everybody tends to think the honeybee is doing all the pollinating when in fact it's not. Okay. Um, what can we do to help these pollinators uh, survive? Well, we can plant more pollinator friendly plants. Um, we can plant pollinator friendly gardens. My wife is doing that. We can do that. We have, we have to give out, we're giving out seed bombs at the, end of the, at the end of the session here tonight that are over on the right hand side if you want to start your own pollinator friendly garden. Um, these are some of the types of uh, plants that are favorable to these uh, pollinators. Milkweed plants, considered a weed, but you know we're now fostering those weeds in our yard now. We're using a milkweed plant. That's what monarchs need to survive. That's apparently the only plant that they they um, they forage on. Yeah, it's the these, only plant. The only, the only one is these uh, milkweeds, which I never knew. I'm learning that now. So, uh, so again, depending on your perspective, uh, people have different perspectives. Well, this is mine. I don't think we should wait any further. I think we should take action. Maybe we, maybe we have to look at data a little bit more closely. I'm not sure. Um, some people are, like uh, Morgan Freeman, has converted. He's convinced he's converted his entire uh, 100, 100 plus acre ranch there to a pollinator friendly bee community. We can become a bee city, <coughs> a Xerxes society, if we want to get involved with more sustainable habitats for pollinators. And this Warren article would be a start to that. Um, you know, in March of this, this past year, we lost the last white rhino, the last breedable species. Okay, So there, there is an extinction crisis going on, whether we all want to agree with it or not. I certainly am convinced there is. And the data, in my opinion, shows that. And you know, we, we, we may have given to environmental organizations. We may think we're early progressive in the environmental perspective. But nonetheless, we are in an extinction crisis. We lost the last white rhino. Everything we tried to do in 2000 from 2018 and before didn't save them. They're gone. Our, my grandchildren, the legacy we're leaving them without these these, these magnificent animals. And uh, I mean, I'm going to you know, I'm going to check out generation here. I mean, I'm looking for these. These are checking. These guys are checking in. We got to save it for them. And maybe we don't 
have all the answers here, but this this presentation, this is an attempt to try to do something. Okay. Uh, birds of prey are in decline. These rodenticides uh, are, are helping to foster their decline. Um, but it's been proven by peer-reviewed studies that it, they're in rapid decline. Um, so what can we do? Well, we can start using poisons. I, I'm convinced is that directly, not, I can't be convinced by anybody on this, I've studied this most, most closely, is that uh, our rodenticides are killing our birds of prey, and, and, we, and it's, 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 a, it's really counterproductive because we're fostering the population of mice and rats, which are vectors for Lyme disease, and so we're going to be affected directly by it as we get Lyme disease. And it's not a very friendly disease, it's a very chronic, debilitating disease if you get it in its worst form. Um, there is a, in addition to that federal article that I mentioned at the beginning of it, there was an article last year um, which was basically looking to restrict these. Okay. Now that, again, they don't, they're not looking to ban them. You know, those of you that are licensed applicators, and they, they have some guidelines as to when they're to be applied. People are going to shout, oh, you're banning them. No, they're not banning them. Okay. They're just providing guidelines. And again, you can, you can make a law, but it's up to the people to follow the guidelines. So this, that bill, oh, by the way, that bill that was uh, failed last year, but it's being reintroduced now. Uh, that bill failed last year, it's being reintroduced again, and uh, so I'll do my thing to try to support that. Uh, that um, here's some resources that, uh, if you want to look into this further, of course, they're all from the perspective of this presentation. Um, there are other resources, undoubtedly, that you have that are from the opposite perspective. And uh, this is the Toxic Action Center. Um, this is a pesticide reduction resource guide for citizens and municipalities of Massachusetts, which is available online at that link. And of course you have the organic, organic, Northeast Organic Farming Association, which is another resource here. Um, I, I thought back in, you know, back in 1960, about the time I found that great horned owl, I remember at that time, you know, Rachel Carson was doing her thing, and I thought, you know, with DDT, and I thought, well, she solved all this stuff, and this was all solved. I thought we didn't have to worry about this. But uh, neither did I know that, in fact, we not. We're, we're, still in, we're still in controversy about all this stuff. Um, so here's, here's some of the wording of the article. Okay? These are the, this basically is the meat of the article. Committing to avoiding the use of systemic pesticides on their property and avoiding the planting of flowering plants which are treated with systemic pesticides. Planting more pollinators supporting foliage on their properties and adopting systemic pesticide for lawn and landscape practices. Nothing is being banned. Nothing is being required. It's, it's a, it's a uh, baby step in the direction, okay, and it's, it's hopefully moving in the right direction. Uh, when, I, when I moved this article, this is my proposal, I'll throw it to you guys. When I moved this article, May 6th, it's going to be at the end of the meeting because it's Article 35, I think, so it's really at the tail end. Everybody's still around at that point in time. Um, I'm going to move the article with these two adders here, okay, for those of you that are in the agricultural community that we were committed to following an integrated pest management plan prepared utilizing guidance available from the UMass Extension Center for Agriculture uh, and the Environment for Agricultural Activities. Now, I, don't, I think that's a really a kind of benign requirement. They have the resource out there. They have, a, they have basically a checklist. Here's the things you do when you apply the pesticides, when you don't apply the pesticides, and what types you use and for what purposes. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a benign, rather benign, but a, 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 neat, a relatively easy thing to do um, to move forward with the intent of this article. And as far as, um, this, is, this is the law, basically. So I'm only asking our DPW to follow the law. You know, following a vegetation management plan prepared in compliance with the rights of way <coughs> management regulations, the CMR 11.0, the Sterling Department of Public Works to control vegetation along the municipal rights of way. So I'm, I'm proposing to make that amendment move the article with those amendments, and hopefully you find those favorable. Again, nothing's being banned, only encouraged. Um, okay, uh, are there, uh, pretty much the rest of these slides are basically, you know, um, what are the other problems in, in life here? This, this talks about the population. And all my life, up until the year, I guess about 19, 1970, ever from Adam and Eve to 1970, there were four billion people in the world, from Adam and Eve to 1970. That's what took that, that long tonight to get four billion people. And within less than my lifetime, there are now eight billion people. It's got to be a factor, right, and all this stuff. We're, we're, we're unsust our population growth has got to be unsustainable. And there's got to be something done about that. Um, but I don't want to get into that. That's a bigger issue, which I can't believe. 
controversial about here. Um, any questions? I have a, a question. Um, so why doesn't the DCR take more of an active role in this? I have, I am not allowed on any DCR field to track my dogs. Tracking requires you can't follow on a track. But yet, all the DCR fields are off limits to anything. Do the, do, why doesn't, if DCR, if Sterling is such a watershed, that DCR has limited all these beautiful fields that nobody can track on, why are they not taking more of an active part? Secondly, why doesn't DCR take more of an active role on the water quality of the area? You say that we have only four water areas that we get our, we tap our water from. Yet the water that comes out of the taps in my house is so contaminated that I had to put in a $5,000 water, water purification system. What is it contaminated with? Lead, um, magnesium, um, this just the... Well, that, that lead should not be coming from the well. That has to be coming from piping in between the and well. And that's coming from the, it's coming from the Sterling, Sterling piping. Yeah, but it, it, I don't believe it's from the water in, at the bottom of that well. It's got to be being picked up by piping. And so and then why hasn't, de why hasn't, well, why I, I, hasn't then we then seen that I showed report? you a slide there. I showed you a slide way back in the beginning yeah. where I said, I, that, was a, that was a comment from the DCR. Mm -hmm. As long as they're not applying that herbicide on the banks or into the water there, we're okay with it, even though it's on the, on the, uh, on the basically on the road that's right above the thing. I have no idea. I, yeah. I, I presented, but I sent they, them pictures. They have, they have, they have signs everywhere. We, You're not allowed on these fields. Yeah, like I said, like I said, there's a, there was right next to yes. a sign, a sprayed herbicide on the road, and right next to a sign it says, don't walk your dog here, it might urinate in the woods at 100 yards in. Exactly. You know, so I, I feel exactly. exactly like you do. I do not have an answer for that. I, I tried so to get an should, answer. They should be tapped into why are you not being and more committed? Again, Absolutely right. But the, the, the way to get action on that is for people that are concerned like we are, is to, is to call them up, to send them letters, to talk about this, to, 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 to clear, you know, basically to point out these dichotomies of their protection, you know, and, and I think then maybe you might get some action. Okay. Um, any other, you had a question over here? Well, I did. This is a resolution that will be in front of the town meeting? Yes. Uh, you know, my suggestion would be on that one, let's uh, see, which, systemic pesticides cause illness and death to bees and pollinators contribute, I would, if it were me, I would write contribute. Can you I tell you what? Could you modify? Can you modify that as you'd like to? Well, pencil that in. The way this is, it implies that. Um, what is it? Well, I, mo I modeled that after the uh, uh, articles in other towns. That's why I did it. That well, way. again, systemic pesticides cause illness and death to bees and pollen. Can um, it's a blunt statement, and, and it gives the impression that they are the only reason for the die-off of bees. I understand. Um, so if they use the if word you would, contribute, if you would mind marking that up and giving that to me, that'll be my reminder to, to make, make that adjustment. I'd be happy to do that. I, I don't have an issue. With that. Any any other questions or concerns? Well, I have a, I have a couple of comments. Sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, you know, I I appreciate Gary for trying to bring awareness. Mm -hmm. But a lot of us in agriculture, and not necessarily in agriculture, um, those of us who are in agriculture that have been involved in having to spray in order to produce whatever it is, apples, in my case Christmas trees, uh, we do as little as possible and we follow the label because it is the law. And you're subject to some severe penalties if you don't do it and they can catch you. And a lot of the problems are because, Joe, homeowner, you mentioned it, that people, I had a brother-in-law that, I don't know, any insect was bad news. And his, his modus operandi was to get a can of spray and blast it inside the house and, you know, right. that kind of, in other words, a lot of the problem is on people who aren't licensed, they can go into stores, Home Depot or whatever, and buy all kinds of nasty stuff. Right. And if the label says a teaspoon per gallon, well, let's see, I'll put it on a tablespoon, maybe 10 tablespoons, and there is a lot of the problem there. Well, I th hopefully this awareness will, will help make Well, that's the thing. I commend you for trying to make right. people aware. But the danger is that people, I swear most people get their news from Facebook today. Mm -hmm. And that, I'll tell you, I never saw so many law firms appear. They must be cashing in. They saw that $289 million award right. in that case. I don't know how that, that surely that's going to be your appeal. And I'll, I'll bet it be it'll be overturned because, uh, be. but, but again, it, sometimes it just gets out of, 
out of control, and I think of the apple grower. I'm not an apple grower, but I guess we got gentlemen here that are. Well, again, yeah. this, this, putting this in there, doesn't this ha satisfy that concern of the apple yeah, grower? Well, that, that's good, but the Joe well, public doesn't follow that. that. Agriculturalists follow that. But I think any of us here are. I follow integrated. It, the spray can is the last thing I look for. Sure. Believe me. And a lot of us, we, I don't grow apples, but I put, I plant all kinds of crab apples, and I have bees like you wouldn't believe. I do everything I can for butterflies. And, but well, so I, I think you're complying already. I kind of already. agriculture a bad name, like we're the bad guys. I don't think we're the bad guys. I, see, that wasn't certainly wasn't the intent here. The intent. Well, that's what happens. Right. So you have to be very careful with the wording. If you, if, if, yeah, how if you present it, that I, I, I can still move this article with, with addition to these changes, which I think are positive and from your perspective. I can make other changes to that. So, um, that another really comment happy to I that. had with respect to dear old Lake Washakum, I guess I'm about the fourth generation to swim there too. My father swam there, and I'm 84 years old. Well, my, my point, I, my point here was not with Lake Washakum. That was just a, a back in the back. Well, yeah. it's our local recreational right. lake, yeah, I, I, and the problem with that lake is cultural eutrophication. Too many houses, too too short a layer of water. Right. You know, the deepest point is I don't know, 35, 40 feet. And um, the septic, maybe 55 in one spot. Um, and <coughs> these motorboats, the large ones, more than 15 horsepower, the state had recommended that they don't use them down there, but they have trouble enforcing that. Right. Most of the people that live there don't want the problem with algae and, and the weeds right. that come in there. Uh, but there are some that they, you know, I got a 50 horsepower, I'm going to use it by God. I, Sure. You know, I, I work and there I earn money and I like to do it. So, there should be better enforcement in well, keeping the boats they, up. There's, there's they, many lakes that I know of that don't that stop completely it. stop. Well, then they need to have, like they, like they have the DCR police. Well, I think around. the answer, the only answer that I've heard from the Conservation Commission is that it would have to be a watershed lake. They, the DCR would probably have to end up, and that would stop the swimming, most likely. And uh, that's what you've got to do to stop that kind of stuff. Because those big 50 horsepower washes up the bottom oh, sediment. I, I can't understand it puts why the it's nutrients not already considered a, DC, a, DC, a watershed. Because the, all of Sterling is a watershed. I'm so limited. I moved here just over a year ago, and I, I participated in a tracking sport. I, I can't find a field to track on because everything is DCR. You can't find what? A, a field to track my, track my dogs. Have you tried Trop Brook? I've I'm been here. Trop Brook is in, just over the line in Holden. And yeah. it's open for dogs. You can take your dog there. Yeah, but it's if, it's a, if it's highly pop populated, I, you know, I sometimes, well, there are sometimes more remote I have, areas to, age, I have to age to track three hours. Well, there's, there's some remote areas on Trop Brook, which where the dogs are allowed, and people bring the dogs there. Yeah, the, I'll, I'll look into it. But, but the thing is, is like, you know, mo why isn't this lake considered a watershed in the first it's not place? It does not, it does not uh, drain into the Wachusett Reservoir. Wasn't there a problem? Yeah. It drains into the National River. Wasn't there a problem that they, didn't, they wanted to maintain the lake themselves within the town? If they allowed outside people in there to get money, if they needed to get money from the state in order to manage it, they didn't want to do that. So then they, they had their own rules. That's why it's all yeah. permanent. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you can restrict by state law access to, to what they call great ponds. I think they have right. to be opened up for no, I, all I state right residents. Here, and I think, again, from what I was told by the Conservation Commission chairperson, that they have to go through the formal process, I don't know about selling it to the DCR, but they would have to forfeit the control that we now have. Forfeit the control. And the DCR would then probably boot off any, you know, like uh, Westlake or Shakem. Well, the DCR isn't. I don't, I don't want to misquote them, but the, the East Lake was shaken pond, the Great Pond itself, right. drains into the National River, not into the Rochester right. 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 So they're not directly. But see, they about. control West Lake Washakum, and you mm -hmm. can't. You can take a canoe there, but there's right. no motorboats right. along. Right. But West Washakum is still part of the metropolitan. Yes, it is. Of water for Boston, and East Lake Washakum was artificially cut off. You know, mm -hmm. the Copper Dam on the east side yeah, of right. Washakum um, drains the water and keeps the water level low so that it can no longer drain into the West Pond. 
Are there, are there any other questions? Well, I'm just going to pass these out while people are... You would care to have these if you don't. Gary, you must have considered too, and I know this sounds like a cop-out, but you know, sometimes, like I said, I commend you for trying to raise awareness. Thank God you. knows we do need it. Um, I taught environmental science for 25 years. Well, where did you teach that? Carbon Regional High School, okay. in Barry. All right, well that's right in the heart of the area then. And I, sometimes, you know, without going to town resolutions, perhaps a handout as people go to town meetings or a mailing or something of that sort, uh, working with the conservation committee, maybe you'd get more. Perhaps. I, I think that, the, that like, like it or not, or favorable or not, I, I tend to think this kind of discussion is favorable. And I think it's, it's favorable because of it being on the warrant. Yeah. It'll, it'll generate the discussion which otherwise wouldn't have generated. Yeah, maybe and and um, so I think that's favorable. If it's defeated, it's defeated. I, I, gave, it a, I gave it the college try, yeah. and uh, I think it raised awareness. Yeah. And like I say, if I could convince one person to not use one of these bait boxes, yeah. I believe I th that I will have saved an owl or a hawk family somewhere, and I think that's worthwhile. I find that I, I, I've helped prevent their demise over the long term. And that, that I find I, I, that's my measure of success. If I, the article doesn't pass, um, that, that's, I'm not happy about that. But if, if I can convince one person in this room to not, that has been using bait boxes or decon for, for rat poison to not use it, maybe an owl or a hawk family has been saved, and I feel that's a success. Well, you had a question back yeah, here? Well, what bothers me about this is these things are not localized on their fly. You can fly it next door. And it, and it travels over in the rain to your property. You find it in your your compost pile that you keep organic, and it's 85 percent. You know, so it, it's these things um, need to be really limited, I think, to an emergency kind of usage. Well, I, I, I know that my my uh, cable guy here had sent for me to repeat questions <laughs> when I got questions in here. I, I'd forgotten about that until the end here, so maybe just not a point, but I. You know, that, that, I thought I'd try to make that point when I, so when I was talking about this. Sort of I got my neighbors all around me are spraying. The, the, the yeah. Ghostbuster shoots come out every other month there, and three neighbors right alongside of me are up there spraying their lawn. I, I, have to, I can't do anything about it. It's perfectly illegal. I can try to convince them. I can do something like this, and that's what I'm doing is trying to convince them. You know, I can't. The point I was going to make is you get a lot of, you know, there's a lot of farmers here that try to be conscientious, but you get the, the ignorant homeowner just because they're going to make their grass greener. Absolutely. And they're out there spraying it down. And and just as an example with me, the other, this was like, not last summer, the summer before, I, had, I turned over a log in my backyard and it was a big ant's nest underneath. My first great thought was to go get a spray bomb and spray it. And I says, hey, wait a minute, I'm, I'm supposed to be against that stuff. It's in my yard, it's back in my yard, it's out of my house. I can, they're out there, I didn't know that they existed. And I, I sat there on a swing, which was near the log I turned over, and within a few minutes, it was almost like a divine intervention, a robin comes along. And he chows down for a good five minutes on those hands. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. It's like, you know, wow, that's, that's neat. That's what I should be doing. Not let, they're out in the woods at, in my back of my house. I don't need to be killing them with poisons. You know, and let the robin take care of them. They're part of the ecosystem. So that type of awareness is what we're looking for. And I hope that this, this type of a, amendment to the article you know, you folks, we're all, as taxpayers, paying for these folks at the UMass Extension Service. They're, they're doing their job because we're paying taxes. And they have a great guideline there for apple growers, all kinds of fruit plant growers, as to how to prepare an integrated pest management plan to minimize the use of pesticides, both systemic and non-systemic. And, it, and it's there. It's already done for you. And you can follow a checklist. And uh, hopefully it's not that difficult. Of course, I'm not, I'm not an apple farmer. I, 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 I worked on a farm going through high school. And I bailed hay, and I did that all summer long for three summers. I, so I know that being a farmer is a hard life. It's a very difficult life. And so adding more requirements doesn't make it easier for them. But I think in the long run, maybe it's not so bad. And I hope that you find that these kind of amendments to this, along with the suggestion you say that, you know, we're not trying to group everything as, 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 a, as, a, as a death sentence for everybody. That's not what I'm trying to do. We're not trying to ban anything here. We're just trying to raise awareness and move in the right direction. 